Hello, and thank you for tuning in. You are listening to the Bringing Inspiration to Earth show. You can listen and subscribe to the show for free on Spotify, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Blog Talk Radio, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Audible. For network or show information, visit BiteRadio.me. And now, the Bringing Inspiration to Earth show. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this edition of the Bringing Inspiration to Earth show. Today, my special guest is Pamela Brinker, and we'll be talking about her work as well as her new book, Conscious Bravery, Caring for Someone with Addiction. In her powerful new book, Conscious Bravery, Pamela Brinker combines her professional knowledge with her personal experiences to create a caring and helpful guide for those who are dealing with loved ones struggling with addiction and or mental health issues. Readers will learn not only how to navigate the emotional roller coaster of addiction, but how to survive and thrive with positivity. Pamela Brinker holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Denver. As a well-respected and experienced psychotherapist and licensed clinical social worker for more than 32 years, Pamela has treated thousands of clients and developed more than 20 tools and practices to teach everyday bravery. Using integrative therapy techniques, she has helped those struggling with anxiety, mild depression, grief, and relationship issues. She has extensive training in somatic work, trauma healing, union psychology, and EMDR certification, integrating body-oriented protocols like yoga, meditation, art forms, and nature into her practice. For more information, you can visit Pamela's website, which is PamelaBrinker.com, and that's P-A-M-E-L-A-B-R-I-N-K-E-R.com. And with that, I'd like to welcome Pamela to the show. Good day, Pamela. Good day. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Robert. You're very welcome, and I enjoyed reading your book. Um, there is um, so much information, just very practical information, which I love. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to sharing that with listeners. Um, mm, before, we so start, <laughs> before we start, you're welcome. Before we start, in your book, um, you when I mentioned that uh, you you know combine your professional as well as personal experiences, in your book you talk about um, addictions, and you talk about your two older, um, your adult sons. And um, first question I wanted to ask you is, you know, how, how, did, how do, did they react you know, to you talking about their particular challenges? And, and you know, did you have um, any hesitation in, in doing that? I did have hesitation, and so I asked their permission, and I told them that I really wanted to honor them and their experiences and really speak from my experience as a mom and a parent and someone who loves someone who struggles with substance use issues and mental health challenges. And they said that it would be fine, that they really wanted me to help the many people who really don't have this kind of information out there. And so I was hesitant, hesitant, hesitant Robert, mm-hmm. because I really mm-hmm. am used to being more didactic. But I really know that we all learn through stories, and we want to break the stigma about substance use issues and mental health in our family and in our work situations. And so really the best way I know how to do that, and my publisher nudged me hard on this too, is to tell my stories and to integrate them and interweave them in the book. So that's the feedback I've gotten from a lot of readers and workshop participants too, that they really appreciate the stories and the vulnerability that I offer. And it was hard to do, you know. It's hard to, to dredge up the memories of some of those really, really horrendous times when my sons were in the throes of addiction. But it really is a testimony to grace and to how far we can come when we really – like, I really put one foot forward in front of the other, went in the trenches, and I continue to do that now. So, 
Um, I really don't offer that I know it all. I just offer my stories, and I just say I'm a lot better than I am than I was 11 years ago now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the the this, and it, it, I'm glad to hear that they you know recognize you know that their stories um, would be helpful you know in the book, and and that's the the one thing I think that, um, you know, I got as I was reading that is, you know, sure, you have those many years as a, as a psychotherapist, and, and that, you know, perspective can be helpful. But, you know, that, that personal um, experience, you know, particularly in the beginning of the book, I think it was in the introduction, you talked about, you know, that, you know, that feeling of dread that sometimes pops up if you get a phone call in the middle of the night you know, or someone knocks on your door, and it's like, oh, my God, now what? You know, and um, and I'm sure that, and I've known a few, quite a few folks who have uh, experienced the same, and it, it can be um, frightening. Oh, it, it is. It's, it's terrifying, and um, not always, but, yeah, I, I get direct mm-hmm. messages from people all of the time who tell me, that they're still in this place of gripping fear or panic or anxiety, you know, and they really want to learn how to manage that. And so I believe that that we learn from each other. <laughs> That's one of the beautiful mm-hmm. things about authentic connection, and we learn from one another. And so I'm here to offer whatever I can to help people, both through my book and through listening and also telling my own story. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Now let's let's start with um, the title, conscious bravery. And can can you talk a little bit about the idea of, of consciousness and just um, conscious choice? Mm-hmm. Consciousness, of course, has a lot of different meanings in different circles. What I mean by consciousness is having awareness. And I combine that word with conscious, with bravery because we need and want to have the awareness to see whatever's needed in any given moment and then take action and make the best choice. And so conscious bravery for me came about 11 years ago when my, my sons first turned to substances as an answer to their pain because I didn't have a protocol available to me to handle it, and I looked through a lot of books and resources and so forth, and got all kinds of therapies, family therapy, individual therapy, acupuncture, chiropractic, you name it, and I was just pulling from all my resources, but I really didn't have one book available to define it, and so I I began to define it myself, that it really is awareness, conscious presence, being able to reset up my nervous system and come into a place where my my brain is actually available to help me. You know, I'm operating more from the prefrontal lobes, the prefrontal cortex, if you will, rather than the brainstem to make a decision about what to do. Yeah. And, and, and oftentimes, and, and, oftentimes the action yeah. is inaction. You know, we've, I, I found that I didn't always want to leap in and try to save the day. In, in many instances, that's not helpful to our loved ones. And so I like to say that Conscious bravery isn't always tough as nails. Bravery can look like softness, and it can sound like stillness, and it can mean waiting patiently until an answer or the the best solution shows itself. Yeah, and and the idea of you know when confronted with with those particular challenges, uh, the the first, I guess, innate, you know, kind of a response is action. You know, what what can I do? You know, I mean, what what mm-hmm. needs to be done? You know, kind of to fix this or or to you know to better this. Um, and you know, um, I don't think often people you know recognize that sometimes the best thing <laughs> is not to do, um, but to but to be there for the individuals. Correct. Mm-hmm. And. You're, you're tapping into something so important that I had to learn because I had been not just a psychotherapist, but I'd also been a triathlete and an endurance athlete for a lot of my life. And so my tendency was to work harder and do more and leap right in. And, and I had to learn how tenderness and patience and softness 
and asking questions were equally as important, if not more. And so I've learned, uh, and I learned back then the hard way, <laughs> that asking questions, like, what do you need right now, my son? How can I support you? Or just listen and say, huh, hmm, and then pause, pause, pause. What do you think you'll do about that? And they hear it in the tone of my voice that I'm curious and I'm supportive and that I have confidence in them. And that is what I would offer our listeners that I hope you don't have to learn the hard way as I did, that our loved ones often need us to show them that we have confidence in them. And so when I used to try to do things that seemed kind of managerial or people talk around the word enabling, um, basically, I was just trying to help. I didn't want to be codependent, and we can talk about that word later. But I really wanted to empower them, and but I wasn't sure how. And so I had to learn and learn how to rewire my brain, <laughs> rewire my actions, so that I could walk alongside them in their wilderness of addiction and let them know they were not alone, and that I had confidence that they would. Make a, make a decision at the time that was their own unique choice, and I would, I would maybe not agree with it, but I would hear it, and I would walk alongside them anyway. And eventually, over time, they make enough mistakes and enough successes that they can find a higher level of health and a greater awareness themselves to make even better choices. But that's the real key, Robert, I feel, that we have to Go learn as we go, you know, and let them see that mistakes are part of the process. Not that I want to just save them from making mistakes, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, and the you know the idea of their validity, <laughs> you know, I mean, their what they're thinking, what they're doing, and, and just listening, you know, and um, and not judging, you know, it can be just, I mean, a real um, switch from what, you know, probably a lot of people around them are, are doing, you know, and, and, you know, their self-worth, you know, can be, um, from their perspective, you know, under attack. And, and, you know, then they begin questioning, which can be really difficult because it needs a, a strong um, self-image in order, I would think, in order to to be brave. Great point. And our loved ones who struggle with mental health issues and substance use issues do have dents in their self-esteem, just like all of us do. And theirs are even greater because they're often under the influence substances and so their judgment is off and so when we judge them adds to their pain and adds to their confusion and so one of the most important things we absolutely can do that is part and parcel with conscious bravery is to be unconditionally loving detached for sure at times but to show non-judgment and to demonstrate partnership which is atypical You know, a lot of a lot of the people um, that have certain views that we know about that are out there would say, "Gosh, you know, people just need to be confronted or told what to do, or you have to give them ultimatums and cut them off." And I don't. I tried that a little bit for a few months here and there, and it it did not work. It only exacerbated the situation and made put my sons into greater danger. And, in fact, you know, like some a couple of times they each chose homelessness because I said, gosh, you know, Mm -hmm. it's so painful watching you make these choices. I will help you if you choose to go to treatment. I will help you financially. But if you don't, I just don't know how much I can help you out. I can give you meals if you want to come over. I can help buy food. I can go meet you at the gas station and put gas in your car. But I can't give you cash or money. And, and instead of um, going to treatment programs a few times, they chose to catch them, mm. and they ended up being homeless, both of them. And it was it was painful, horrendously painful. And I write about a couple of those stories in the book. And um, and yet, I was talking with my friend Kevin McCauley from the Meadows. So he's one of the didactic mm. um, people that teaches the 11 Meadows Centers. I have such huge respect for him. And he and I were talking about the power of volition, 
there's so much power when our loved ones make some of their own choices, if not many of them. And yeah, empowers because, them and it empowers us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, that, that's what life is. It's really just making a series of choices. And um, mm-hmm. and it's just um, a matter of making choices that would help one's life or hinder, you know, one's life. And, um, you know, and being, like you say, consciously aware. Um, now, in, in your book, you, you talk about um, going beyond mindfulness into whole being awareness. Um, I thought that was interesting because, you know, there's so much talk right now about mindfulness. <laughs> you know, just, just be mindful, mm-hmm. you know, of our of our state of being. <laughs> um, but, you, you know, you kind of go, say, let's go beyond that and the whole being awareness. So tell us um, a little bit about your perspective about the mindfulness and then, you know, going beyond that to the whole being awareness and what that is. Mm-hmm. Well, someone with me, the idea of mindfulness you and our listeners, what does it mean to be mindful? We really mean that it's to be attentive and awake, not just going through the motions, right? We're conscious while we're doing something, whether it's tasting our food while eating or experiencing awareness while we're writing an email or really being present, looking someone in the eyes. But really mindfulness, even though it's a superb practice for paying attention, on purpose to present moment phenomena, I would say it's really a word that conjures the mind, (laughs) which is the opposite of what we're really trying to accomplish. And so I love the phrase whole being awareness because it it conjures being aware from our whole being. This, This is one of the pillars of bravery for me, that we can tune in to six zones of our experience. And so, again, if you will with me, Tap into not just your mind, but also tune into, and we'll walk through this really quick if you don't mind with me, to your heart, your body, your intuition, the energetic space around you, and your essence. So certainly the mind works in our favor all of the time. And our thinking guides us and helps us. It's a database, a, a data storage, and it helps us with memories and so forth. But it's not the end all. And so we want to sure... Sure enough, tune into awareness with what people call mindfulness, what's going on in our minds, and notice that. But then we also want to tune into what's going on in our hearts. What am I feeling? And we could feel seemingly opposing things at the same time. Like I could feel energized while at the same time uh, slowed down and lethargic or immobilized. I could feel some level of happiness but also some fear, right? And so we tune into our minds and then our hearts. We tap into our bodies. What's happening in my body? And I'd love you to ask yourself right now as you're listening, what's happening in your body? You might be feeling a lump in your throat and maybe some um, activation in your legs, sort of like you want to move, but you might also be feeling um, like you just need to sit still and you want to kind of calm down. So we just notice, just like we do with our loved ones, we notice things that are happening and don't judge. We postpone judgment. We, we're just curious. That's what we're going to do with our whole being as we do this whole being scan that I'm leading us into. So we tap into our bodies, our minds, our hearts, and our bodies, and then we notice what's going on in my intuition. Is my intuition telling me something? Not that the intuition is the end all either, but our intuition might be saying, hey, wait a moment. Slow down. Or our intuition might say, do this now. You're afraid, but you got to do it anyway. You know, so we just note that. And then we tap into the energy space around us. If we can all draw an imaginary bubble around ourselves with our arms all the way up in a circle above our heads and all the way around us in a kind of a, in a circumference circle, that's our energetic space. And that space has awareness as well because as people like Dan Siegel have taught us, our bodies go in with our skin. Who we are extends into the space around us, and there's an energetic space in our environment, too, that is giving us data. So we want to know the that. Is my energy vibing? Is it lethargic? Is it chaotic? And lastly, we want to come into our essence, go into the deepest part of us. Some people call it the soul. Some people call it the self. I prefer the elegant word essence because it's less laden with other meanings. And so we tune into that because that's 
that's really, Robert, who we've been from before we were born into the now and throughout our lives and into death and beyond. It's, it's our truest self. And it's the most unwavering self. And it's connected to something greater, right? It's really hard to say. You were asking what consciousness is. And a lot of us, you know, research shows that consciousness is really outside of the mind. It's really outside of us. It's hard to put a, put a place on where consciousness exists. But it seems to somehow be connected with this essence, this truest self that we are. And so we could quickly do a whole being scan like that to say, what's going on in my my mind, my heart, my body, my intuition, my energetic space, and my essence. And we can do that. I've learned to do it in a minute or less so that I have a database from which not only to see where I'm at, I can see, okay, wow, I'm really, really anxious right now. I didn't notice it before, and I'm fearful. Or I'm, I'm actually hopeful here. Huh, I'm going to pause, and now I reset. And I, I can make a better choice. What will I what will I choose to do, if anything? Well, I like that. I mean, it really takes into account um, really the, the full spectrum of um, energy and, and knowledge, uh, self knowledge um, that one would have. And you know, the essence, I um, I did a a book of stories with caregivers, and when I had them uh, write their stories, I wanted them to focus on the essence of the individual who needed care, um, mm-hmm. because it seemed to me, you know, that is, like you say, that is the the one thing that, you know, in one way we're, we're born into this world um, with a particular a predisposition, maybe, um, and then you know when we leave this world, I mean, we there is a a core sense of being um, that an individual has, and, and I know like when in the caregiving aspect, it was you know important for caregivers to to recognize the essence of the individual, and and I would think that also when when it comes to addictions, you know that it's you know as important, you know, for those who are going through the challenges either of of addictions or even mental health um, challenges, that um, they get um, a picture of their essence, you know, that that they recognize that, you know, there's more to themselves than the choices that they have been making up to that point, you know, and um, Mm. they need to keep that in mind. Yes, that's wonderful that you wrote about that and that you see that as well and we're in agreement because we really want to have the capacity to be more clear, right? Sometimes we need to become either calmer or sometimes we need to activate more. And our essence can guide us into that. And with that whole being scan, we can be able to broaden our repertoire of response choices and rouse the bravery we need. Yeah, yeah, very much. So I think now, a lot of us define our with our situations or our roles, or you know, we mm-hmm. think who we are is I'm a mom or I'm a, an entrepreneur or uh, whatever. We we define ourselves with our talents, or skills, or roles versus I am my essence. And so you're right. Those who struggle with addiction and those of us who walk alongside them have have got to find the benefit and commit to re-entering the space in which we truly exist just by breathing and going inside and saying, okay, I'm not the situation or the circumstance. I am my essence. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And I know um, it's important. Um, I, I've um, talked to many folk and, and you know, recognize that, um, you know, and, and when one focuses on essence, um, you know, judgment, you know, kind of gets kind of thrown aside in, in the sense that, you know, this is, you know, kind of this is who I am at my soul level, and, um, you know, and these are the good things um, about that, and, and, you know, then translate that into actions. Um, but now, with with the whole being awareness, you know, and, and doing that, you know, covering the mind, body, intuition, and that, um, you also, in your book, um, talk about um, living with a present moment 
now there's this <laughs> approach. So um, let, can you talk about that? Because I thought that was uh, was very interesting. And, you know, when, when it comes to um, walking us, aside, you know, walking by the side of in, individuals going through those challenges, now there's this <laughs> kind of pops up often. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd love to. I, most of us want to live in presence, but how do we do that? It's wonderful to have a meditation practice. It's wonderful as you um, interviewed Mikhail. Am I saying his name right, the dream worker? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and he, and, he and I both talk about dream work. It's wonderful to have a practice of accessing our dreams, to be, to be able to be more present in our waking life and to meditate and, and do whatever, like I love yoga and I encourage most people, I think yoga is very underrated and it can help us be in our bodies and in our whole being. Hiking and nature can do that, but really we need more, how do I return to present? How do I re-present? We need more answers about that. And I believe it starts with a commitment and a belief. And my belief is that we must actively surrender to the moment because it's already arrived. <laughs> This moment is already mm -hmm. here. Here it is. And whatever circumstance is in my life has arrived. I can't fight it. And so why wrestle? Why, why create my own pain and suffering by wrestling with what already is? And so I like the phrase, now there's this. Because I, I find that with my clients and friends and family and workshop participants, that they are able to then actively surrender to the moment. And we, we say, huh, okay, this has happened. We get some, some news that we think is bad, it's unexpected. We're hearing maybe even something horrific, or we've been devastated by something, and we suddenly have to, to either do something about it or sit with it and decide how we'll handle this. So, you know, you can try it with me again if you would. Just try saying, hmm, now there's this. Instead of, oh, my God, oh, I can't do this, which I've said plenty of times in my life, I, I can't handle this. But the I can't is already embedding into my body and my whole being that I won't be able to take this on. And so then I will kick into the sympathetic nervous system's responses of either fleeing, wanting to run away from my situation, or fighting it, and arguing, or, you know, just not, not, uh, not allowing it. Or I might want to kind of feign death, as you will, and kind of curl up in a ball and want to disappear so that I can be unseen, disassociate, if you will. Um, those are some of the responses of the, the sympathetic nervous system, right? Or I might want to fawn, which is kind of please someone else and try to kind of avoid conflict. But none of those responses really work very well. They're, they're really old. And so we want to rewire our brains and bodies, right? And the only way to do that is by practicing during the calm moments and practicing when we're under fire. At least that's what I've learned. I've had to practice when I'm under fire plenty of times. So I remember mm -hmm. getting a call about a year and a half ago from a treatment center that had suddenly discharged my son. And I lived hours away, and they wanted me to come and pick him up, and they were recommending three programs for him that would be higher-level care because he had some mental health challenges. And they said, you know, one of them's in, in California, and that's the one he's choosing. And um, I said, gosh, that means me dropping everything, all my clients this afternoon, getting an airplane flight for both him and myself and maybe my husband because we've got to use his thing. And, and you want us to do this within just a few hours? And they said, yes, it's not our responsibility. <laughs> so um, treatment centers sometimes – have um, really important reasons why they do what they do, and they were trying to guard their own clientele, which I, I understood later, but in the moment, I was shocked, and I was mad, and I was so upset, and I didn't feel I had the capacity yet to do all that was being asked of me. And so I remember standing and anchoring my feet on the ground, even kicking off my shoes and standing barefoot on my kitchen floor, and just breathing in consciously and saying, now there's this. And I breathed consciously mm. into my whole being for a lot of moments. I'm not sure how long. And then I was able to return the call. We had hung up and returned the call and say, okay, 
I, I can do this. Let's let's make it happen. And then I got on the phone with my son and was able to be more reassuring to him that this would work out. Mm-hmm. But I think I, I think it would have been a very, very different outcome, Robert, if I had not said to myself in practice that now there's this approach. The assertive surrender to the now for me at that moment was a very strong stance. I pretty much just rose myself out of the <laughs> the rut I was in and asked vulnerably, mm-hmm. kind of in, in my bare feet, well, wow, how can I partner with this moment instead of fighting it? Yeah, yeah, that's that's real important, and that's hard to do, <laughs> you know. But um, it is, it's it is. It's so hard. Mm-hmm. Who wants to yield? Because we we are taught that surrender is defeat. But as my friend Brad Reedy says, surrender is actually a, an assertive response. We're assertive when we see what's happening and see what is, and we say, I'm right here with it. And that's what I mean when I say, now there's this. And so we practice it, and we start, we start to rebuild and rewire our instinctual responses so that we have, at least for me, I've found, and many of my clients have found that they have fewer and fewer actively panic, devastating moments. You know, they might feel shock and uh, the devastation, well, I shouldn't say devastating moments, devastating periods of time because we can have feelings, mm-hmm. but we don't have the feeling state of being devastated for quite as long as we used to. The more we start to rebuild and reboot in a different way and, and rewire and start to build in this instinctual bravery that has to be trained and cultivated in ourselves. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're um, a little past halfway through the show, Pamela, so I want to take a, a quick break. Um, and then when we return, you know, we talked a little bit about um, the pillars of conscious bravery, um, but I kind of want to kind of cover them in one particular spot so that uh, we can uh, have our listeners know um, what conscious bravery is built on, Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Everyone stay tuned. We'll be right back after this brief break. Hello. This is Robert Sharp. I want to thank you for joining us, and I hope that you are enjoying today's show. Just a reminder that we have a wealth of information and resources available on our website, byteradio.me. There is a calendar of upcoming shows, along with an archive link that will give you access to more than 1,600 shows that we have had during the past 12 years. Also on the site is a link to the products and services we provide, books, nature photography, calendars, and 5 by 7 photo greeting cards. Our show is a free podcast on Blog Talk Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and TuneIn. And you can subscribe for free on any of those platforms by using the links on our website homepage. We are on social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, etc. And we also have buttons to those platforms on the top of our homepage. Our website, ByteRadio.me, has much for you to explore and enjoy. I also very much appreciate you supporting our guests and especially today's guest. And now, back to the show. Okay, everyone, thank you for staying with us. Again, today, my special guest is Pamela Brinker, and we're talking about her new book, Conscious Bravery, Caring for Someone with Addiction. Um, Again, you can find out more by visiting her website, which is PamelaBrinker.com. Okay, we're back, Pamela. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Well, now, before we, before we do the pillars, um, I just wanted to mention, you know, your, the title of your book is, you know, Caring for Someone with Addiction. Um, but I, also we mentioned, you know, the challenges of mental health, some people experience it. But really, conscious bravery, um, it can be applied to any kind of situation that requires courage, correct? Absolutely. Our bravery is part of our humanness, Robert, like love, and it's a sacred capacity, but it it has to be cultivated like love. You know, we don't just love well just because we 
we want to, but that desire of wanting to be more brave does help us with the motivation to start taking the steps toward it. And so, yes, conscious bravery, I think, is something that all of us need in any situation, in grief. If we've lost someone we care about or someone has moved away or if we are dealing with a tremendous personal challenge like loss of a job or even just a change in, in job or a situation. Or if our parent has Alzheimer's or one of our, someone we care about has been diagnosed with something like cancer or, or an immune um, issue. So, so yes, everyone <laughs> wants conscious bravery. Mm -hmm. You know, we want the capacity to be courageous and we want to be able to do it consciously. But, um, we don't always know how to, to get to that. How do, how do we build those skills? So that's why I came up with the pillars of conscious bravery. <laughs> Great. Per perfect transition. <laughs> so, let's go ahead and, and talk about those pillars. Again, we mentioned some of them during the first half of the show, but I kind of wanted the listeners to get an idea of the pillars in one one spot. Sure. So uh, we already talked about that we are our essence. We're not defined by our situation or our circumstances. We we spoke about how mindfulness is helpful, and it's a really wonderful term, but perhaps a, a more accurate phrase that we can start building into our repertoire is whole being awareness. And so knowing we are our essence and knowing, using whole being awareness are two of the pillars of conscious bravery. They're how we get to it and start embedding it into us so that it does become instinctual in any given moment, no matter what our situation. But another pillar of conscious bravery is to befriend all of our feelings. And I write about mm. why I struggled that struggled with that. It's so hard to feel shame. It's so hard for me to feel helpless. And I hate that feeling of helplessness and not knowing what to do and not being able to do anything more than just about anything. And we, we most of us long for control. And so, but, but how do we make friends with helplessness or shame? We start by really making a commitment to who we truly are, that we are these humans. And part of our human experience is having emotions. And it's interesting, but all the emotions that are the toughest for us to embrace usually have a flip side that enables that emotion to exist. For example, a friend and I were talking the other evening that, that joy and suffering are actually flip sides of the same coin. And that if he can allow his suffering and be more, be honest with himself with what he was saying, that he actually is struggling in a certain way in his marriage, um, that he can then maybe have more joy in other arenas of his life because he's actually allowing himself to be confused. And I know he wouldn't mind that I'm saying this, plus I'm not saying who he is. But by <laughs> that experience, I'm thinking of that uh, situation because it's indicative for, of so many of our experiences that we really are afraid of the fullness of our emotion because we're afraid we're going to fall apart or if we really feel our anger that we're going to rage. Right? But to me, anger is usually about injustice, or at least felt injustice. And I oftentimes say, okay, go underneath that and see whatever else exists there with it, because anger is usually kind of a spokesperson emotion for another emotion. But if we don't allow it, if we don't allow ourselves to feel the anger and say, hey, this is a part of me, or feel the fear and say, hey, maybe fear is trying to advise me of something, then we can't really get to what the solution is, which is maybe to also find greater contentment in our lives. And so that's one of the primary pillars, is befriending all of our emotions and being really real, being able to have a safe space for our emotions. And oftentimes we have to do this through what we therapists call co-regulation. We have to practice with a, a skilled therapist who's kind and loving and compassionate and non-judgmental, who can listen to us as we say for the 50th time, I'm scared, or I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And they can say, this is really hard. Or, wow, you're really hard on yourself, you know, that you don't feel that you can do this. You've done a lot of tough things before. Do you know that you can? You know, so anyway, co-regulation helps, self-regulation helps with befriending our feelings. Secondly, another pillar is becoming comfortable with discomfort. So it's really similar to befriending our feelings, but... But I wrote a, a chapter on it separately, Robert, because 
it is really the hardest thing for people to embrace when we are either struggling with substance use ourselves or grief or we're walking along beside someone in the wilderness who struggles. It's really tough to become comfortable with overwhelm, for example. Not just discomfort, but yeah. it's fierce friends, overwhelm. So we want to be able to say, like I had to do a bunch of times, and I continue to do, wow, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. Okay, breathing into mm-hmm. that, consciously I'm allowing it. And we don't allow it for days necessarily, but we allow it for moments, minutes, or hours, because then we can kind of come full circle in the rest of our being and maybe whatever's greater God or the universe can help us through that, because we can say, I am not this. I am not just overwhelmed. This is an experience I'm having. And by allowing it, then answers or some solutions or options start coming to us. And another pillar of conscious bravery is conscious breathing, because how do we befriend feelings and how do we become comfortable with overwhelm? We breathe consciously into what is happening in our whole being. And so I'll often say, okay, breathing in. I'm aware of my breath. Breathing out, I'm aware of my beautiful out breath. Breathing in, I'm grounding. Breathing out, I'm releasing. But breathing in, I'm allowing this overwhelm. Breathing out, I know I'm not defined by it. Breathing in, I'm allowing this fear. Breathing out, I'm going to let it advise me rather than be terrified by the fear itself. And so conscious breathing is a foundational practice, really. If anyone who's listening could go away with one practice that helps them to start to build step-by-step your conscious bravery, it would be breathing consciously. And breathing consciously isn't just taking three deep breaths. A lot of people say that. <laughs> take three deep breaths. Or take a deep breath. <laughs> but uh-huh. even though deep breaths are wonderful at either activating us or de-escalating us, they're not the end all. The exhale is, is super important if we want to calm down, and the inhale is important if we want to rise up, but conscious breathing is much more than just three deep breaths. It's tuning into and allowing what's happening in our bodies, our whole being right now, our experience. And so, lastly, once we've learned how to do these things, and we learn by practicing them all the time, this is, there's no conscious breathing with the wave of a magic wand, right? It doesn't just kind of arrive. We have to practice. But the last one really is is what we've already talked about, being able to know that we are our essence and to use whole being awareness to tap into it. Yeah, those those are wonderful. Um, They're challenging. They can be challenging. I mean, you know, the idea of, um, you know, befriending all of your feelings, even those that uh, make one anxious, um, can be. Um, I mean, it's 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 a, um, it's a it would be the learned response. I mean, uh, it would have to be a something that is is practiced because I, I don't think in society, you know, the, the, there is a um, a jump, you know, to to embrace all one's feelings um, or to to embrace mm-hmm. discomfort. But but um, you know that is. I mean, by doing that, I can see where you, in essence, really disarm the, um, what's attached, you know, some of the angst that might be attached to that. Um, That's a great way to describe it. We disarm. Mm Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Thanks. Now, one of the um, elements, um, that you talk about in your book um, regarding conscious bravery is the idea to cultivate regular self-care practices, do something every day for you. Now, in your book, at the end of each chapter, you have something called bravery keys. You know, those are kind of like the little you know, words of wisdom <laughs> at the end of each chapter, you know, for, for people to, to kind of, um, you know, ponder. Um, and now one of them is that says that self-care is a fulfilling and necessary luxury. Now, my question to you <laughs> is that um, should we be viewing self-care as a luxury or a necessity, really? 
Great question. Yeah, I like to say self-care is a fulfilling and necessary luxury because it's actually a necessity that feels like a luxury. <laughs> and so uh-huh. that's kind of how I get my foot in the door with some folks. But, but yeah, a lot of people maybe think of self-care as going to get a massage or going away for a weekend in, in May when it's only January. But, but really, self-care is so important, as you're saying. It's absolutely necessary. It's how – my friend Brad Reedy talks about this. It's how the Dalai Lama is able – to do what he does, going in to see prisoners on death row. We really have to have that approach to self-care. It's it's absolutely uh, an exhibit, um, an activation maybe better, of our own high regard for not just ourselves, mm-hmm. but the capacity we want to build bravery. It's really the foundation upon which we walk that helps us get step by step into conscious bravery. And it the research supports this that we ha- can only find and protect our happiness and adapt to change, face the unknown, begin to alter our lives when we also have capacity. We have our cups full or, you know, at least more than half filled, right? Or at least we're we're mm-hmm. putting drops into the cup. <laughs> you know, and some days it's, for mm-hmm. me it's just been drops into the cup. But I guard my mm-hmm. self care with my life, truly. And I guard my happiness with my life too, because how can I be a role model for my loved ones and show them that they don't have to have substances to face their pain if I don't? And so for me self care is how I I nurture myself. If I'm feeling a lot of pain or despair or anxiety or anything, if I'm just feeling disrupted or agitated or frustrated, I know I need to do something. And it might just be a 10-minute walk. You know, so even even 10 minutes getting outside in nature, we're connecting to the sky and we're seeing the trees and we're moving our bodies. And if we can do it for 20 minutes, go for a walk or a hike or a bike ride or do some yoga or whatever anyone loves, swimming, kayaking, these things are... The ING words, swimming, hiking, biking, you know, those things actually mm-hmm. boost our endorphins. And so they give us capacity. <laughs> and so self-care is really absolutely soulfully satisfying. It's renewing. It's energizing. And, you know, Robert, you may just – and thank you so much for reading my book. You know, in my book, I, I give the example of the tree of life as uh, our self-care, a model and a metaphor, a symbol for our self-care. And I love the symbol of the tree of life because you have your roots that are reaching downwards. You have this really strong trunk that can bend and sway even in high winds. And then you have these branches that grow and change. And so the tree of life is a really great metaphor for how we can embed self-care into our lives and anchor ourselves so we can actually be a tall tree that can bend and, and sway uh, and not be defined by circumstances or the weather, if you will. Yeah, yeah. It, it is a wonderful metaphor, you know. And, and you know, the mm-hmm. idea of, of one of my favorite um, balance and grounding is, is definitely being with nature. I, I'm constantly mm-hmm. um, out in nature. That's just um you know, that's what kind of um, brings me that uh, bliss <laughs> that, that I, I need. In mm-hmm. um, yeah. So now, if one has um, fear or anxiety kind of just running through their head, you know, that, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, once we entertain those feelings, um then um, they can kind of snowball in a, in a way, you know, and then the mind would just, you know, keep picking up things, to, you know, for us to, to validate those feelings. So what can one do if they find themselves just in that constant mind flow of fear or anxiety? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question, because everyone has, Fear is a human experience, but it, it could be the most unnerving and daunting force that we face, right? Fear or terror even. And so since it's part of our story, we want to start realizing that it is. That's where we begin. 
we have this awareness that fear is part of the human process, experiencing fear, thinking thoughts that are fear-based. And we want to be able to notice, not just our thinking, but our feelings, what's happening in our bodies when we're afraid. You know, because lots of times something gets tight, something gets stiff, something hurts. Sometimes we might even injure ourselves. And so fear can cause our stomachs to churn, all these kinds of things. But what I encourage is to say, hey, this is, to first notice what's happening. And then say, hey, this is the part of my story where I'm gripped by fear. Hmm. Okay. And then we use some of these other practices that we've learned. Now there's this. Now there's this meaning. What's happening is I'm feeling overtaken by fear. Huh. And so oftentimes we need something physical to help us. And so we can even put, give ourselves a hug, cross one arm over our the floor in front of our bodies and give ourselves a hug. We can place one hand on our hearts, one hand on our bellies, which is the second brain, or we can put one hand on the top of our heads and say, hey, this is a part of my story where I'm feeling overwhelmed. Or we can sit down, ground our feet, get barefoot. As you were saying, I love to go out in nature and do grounding, get barefoot in nature, just on the soil in my backyard. People can do that at work, just go outside for a walk, see the trees, feel the breeze, look at the sky and connect with something greater than ourselves. Because the thing is, Robert, when fear grips us, we have got to derail it a little bit. We want to just embrace it for sure, but then help it have a place to go. And so I say that fear is is in addition to being a force, it's also an advisor. So what is, what is fear telling me? Instead of just ruminating like, oh, I'm going to this place, going to die, oh, he's not going to get a treatment, oh, he hasn't eaten, look how thin he is, oh, my gosh, she's drunk again, she's passed out on the sofa, holy moly, what am I going to do? Do I call someone? What do I do? So we feel all these things when we see what's happening. But maybe we say, okay, fear is talking to me. Fear is advising me. I'm going to, as I said, get out in nature or get out of this room for a minute, walk, be with myself, give myself a hug. And listen and allow fear to be there and then allow the rest of me to inform me. But where I was going with that is it's impossible for us to resource, resource solely from within ourselves. And so I also teach, and it's not in this book, but it's, it'll be in a blog coming up and in my next book. I also teach what I call the triad of connection, which is that we have ourselves. That's one of the three points on the triangle. We also have one another. So we have authentic others to turn to. We can turn to a mentor or call a friend or text our therapist or turn to a support group that we're a part of or read a blog or research some information. You know, we have authentic others. And then we have what's greater, something that's greater than ourselves. Call it the Tao, nature, the universe, the infinite, God, source, whatever you want to call it, the beloved. We are connected to this infinite, infinitely expanding universe. And, and so we can tap into that in nature. We can reach one arm up to the sky and the other arm down to the earth. And we can say, hey, I'm feeling fear, but you know what? I'm right here in this third dimension. I'm right here on this ground. But I'm also part of an intricate web of something that's greater than me. I'm part of this universe. And this moment won't always be. This emotion will change. This situation will change. And so the more I'm right here without fear overwhelming me, the better I'll be able to make a choice that will get me to the future I want. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, there are so many practices that you have in your book that are, you know, wonderful uh, application of, of the, um, the concepts that you, you talk about. And and that was that's one of the things I like about, about your book is that, you, you know, there, there's mm-hmm. a way to apply what, what one learns. Um, and another thing is at the very end of your book, you have a really nice uh, list of resources for people to explore. Um, and I think that's, um, that's just a, such a plus, you know, that, that people can, you know, they can read about something in your book and then if they want to explore further, you give them, you know, a possible roadmap or at least options to explore further, which um, I think is also um, a wonderful plus. Um, okay, well, we're down to the end of the show. Maybe I just 
you know, I just I just think it's it's, it's just. You know, so many times when one reads a, um, a book about, you know, how to in, improve life, now, first of all, it's like, how, you know, how do I translate this into my life? You know, how do I apply, you know, what's learned? And, and then the next thing is, you know, what if I want to learn more? You know, where, where can I go? So you, you've got those conquered in, in the book. So, um, but now, again, toward the end of the show, what is it that you hope? that the readers will take away from reading Conscious Bravery? I hope that you listeners will be able to live from curiosity rather than fear and live from what I call wonder and joy rather than despair with Conscious Bravery. And how to do that, the book is is a good uh, resource for you. It's available on Amazon. We'll probably talk about that in a minute. But I also have blogs that I've written on my website. And I also have a bunch of two-minute videos on my YouTube channel that would help people, I think, and how to protect their happiness and to live from wonder and joy rather than despair. Oh, that's that's great. Very good resources. Well, Pamela, thank you for your time mm-hmm. today. Again, I, I enjoyed the book, obviously. <laughs> so, um, so I definitely oh, thank recommend you so listeners. Much. <laughs> You're welcome. So I recommend listeners to um, pick it up and um, and be able to start um, living consciously brave. So, thank you for your time today. Now, you are on social media, correct? So people can follow you. Obviously, that's your YouTube channel, but um, also on other media platforms as well. Yes, yes. Thank you, Robert. I'm on Instagram as Pamela Brinker Bravery, and I'm on Facebook, Pamela Brinker Author, and then my YouTube channel, of course, is just at Pamela Brinker, and I would really appreciate it if you do like and find um, help from my YouTube channel, if you, should, if you could subscribe. That would, that's great. That helps me hear from people and so forth. You can write comments. And then my website, of course, has resources, and you can get a hold of me. Through the website, there's a link to my email, and that you said um, earlier is at Pamela Brinker, or PamelaBrinker.com, pardon me. And thank you so much. It's just a joy and a delight talking with you, Robert. You're so gracious, and you provide such value to your listeners. Well, thank you very much. And, and if I haven't connected with you yet on those platforms, I will be <laughs> by the end of the day. So Great. I'm looking forward thank to you. it. Thank you. I'm looking forward to continuing our, our connections. So, again, I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. I am, too. You're welcome. Again, everyone, today my special guest has been Pamela Brinker, and we've been talking about her new book, Conscious Bravery, Caring for Someone with Addiction. And, again, as she mentioned, you can find out a lot more information by visiting her website, which is PamelaBrinker.com, and that's P-A-M-E-L-A-B-R-I-N-K-E-R.com. So, everyone, I want to thank you for joining us for this edition of the Bringing Inspiration to Earth show. And until we meet again, thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Bringing Inspiration to Earth show. Remember, our show is available as a free podcast from Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Blog Talk Radio, Amazon Music, and Audible. To follow our show on any of those platforms, visit ByteRadio.me and select the one you use most. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ByteRadioMe. Until we meet again, remember to be a bright light by bringing inspiration to your world and to the lives of those you touch.